If you ever head near the DeMonte Ranch area of Reno, you may be able to spot wild horses. Usually, they congregate in the open fields by Miraloma Road. Sometimes, the wild horses wander into the suburbs from the gate in search of food and water. Too many of them are later struck by motorists. From 2019 to 2021, there were 25 incidents of horse vehicle collisions. Four horses ran off while 21 others either died from the collision or were later euthanized. In 2022, there were an additional eight collisions with horses. The city has been looking for various solutions to help reduce horse vehicle collisions. One attempt was to install advance warning signs so drivers can be aware that there may be a horse in the area. This was largely ineffective. Tracy Wilson, the special projects coordinator with the American Wild Horse Campaign, explained, The problem with signs is once people see them a couple of times, they stop noticing them. She noted people would ask for more signage, not realizing that it was already there. The real issue is a lot of these collisions would happen at night, in poorly lit areas. More recently, the city has tried another solution, changing the nighttime speed limit along Veterans Parkway to 35 miles per hour. Lowering the speed limit has good intentions, because collisions at lower speeds are less likely to be fatal, and it gives drivers more time to notice their surroundings. But this is not a solution. It fails to even begin to comprehend the actual problem. The horse vehicle collisions is a symptom of a much bigger issue. Much like how a significant number of horse vehicle collisions occur at night, over 70% of all fatal pedestrian crashes also occur from dusk to dawn. Oftentimes, this is blamed on pedestrians not being visible enough. People are constantly being advised to wear bright clothing, walk in well-lit areas, and carry a flashlight. Even if someone were to follow this advice when walking around DeMonte Ranch, they wouldn't be much safer. This neighborhood is dangerous both at night and during the day, because it is built around the speed of cars, not the safety of pedestrians or cyclists. Veterans Parkway sports what traffic engineers like to call forgiving design. The lanes are wide enough to provide some wiggle room in case of swerving, there is a clear zone in case the driver loses control of their vehicle and swerves off the road entirely, although there doesn't seem to be much concern with placing a painted bike gutter along that trajectory. This design approach is known to increase safety of drivers, while also making it feel comfortable to drive fast. In order to allow drivers to maintain their speed while making turns, DeMonte Ranch also contains a lot of corners that allow wide turns and slip lanes. The problem with slip lanes is it allows drivers to look left onto oncoming traffic, completely missing the pedestrian to their right, and then they accelerate to the speed of the road that they are turning into. The intersections that allow wide turns also have the same effect. Take this intersection between Veterans Parkway and Steamboat Parkway. Since drivers are focused onto oncoming traffic, they probably aren't going to be checking for pedestrians who are about to cross. It can be very frustrating not being able to cross the street because other drivers are making their turn first. Even on smaller streets, it can still be difficult to cross. There is nothing to get drivers to slow down other than pedestrian beacons, which I have briefly discussed in a previous short, so they usually blow through crosswalks even if a group of people are waiting to cross. It is a lot to expect drivers to stop for pedestrians on this side of town. I feel the need to bring this up because if the built environment is dangerous for humans, then it is especially going to be dangerous for wild animals. Extending beyond safety concerns, people who live in DeMonte Ranch are exposed to a lot of noise pollution. This is a suburb that requires a car to get around. So as everyone drives from place to place, they are blasting the surroundings with sounds of tires rolling on asphalt, roaring engines, honking horns, and the occasional car alarm. This is Reno spoke with residents of the Esprit Apartments, and one of them said, There's a large amount of traffic that is just very, very noisy. This is an expensive area to live. I don't think we should be subject to this noise day and night. And what's worse is there's a lot of reckless driving. You can hear them doing donuts, burnouts, and street racing. 
Street racing was making a lot of headlines in Reno last year. Some reckless drivers see these wide, forgiving roads and take the opportunity to race their own cars on them. Last year, there were efforts made to crack down on street racing, especially in the areas of McCarran Boulevard and Veterans Parkway. But since this is not an isolated incident, there is no reason to believe it won't happen in the future. Lowering the speed limit is the right idea to addressing each of these problems. However, properly slowing down the cars requires more work than simply changing the signs. Speed is a product of design, and the original 45 miles per hour speed limit on Veterans Parkway comes from a concept called the 85th percentile rule. In the United States, speed limits are calculated by performing a traffic study to capture everyone's speeds, removing the top 15% of speeds, and then rounding down to the nearest 5 miles per hour. This standard comes from a 1964 study titled Accidents on Main Rural Highways Related to Speed, Driver, and Vehicle. This study recorded 10,000 drivers across two-lane and four-lane highways and discovered vehicles traveling 10 to 15 miles per hour less than the average speed had a much greater chance of being involved in a crash. Since the fatality rate was the highest at very high speeds and lowest at about the average speed, it was decided that having drivers maintain the 85th percentile speed would be safer for every vehicle on the road. This coupled with the aforementioned forgiving design did a fantastic job increasing roadway safety on highways and rural roads. Unfortunately, this was applied everywhere. There was no consideration to if people would be walking across the street, if there would be schools, libraries, or parks along the street, or if businesses and homes would have direct access to the street. Even though the scope of the study was for rural roadways and highways, the conclusions were applied everywhere. So for decades, city streets were built to a freeway standard, creating places that are noisy, hostile, and dangerous. Despite the consequences, traffic engineers blindly follow this standard, even using it to dismiss people's concerns with speeding. Last year, the Regional Transportation Commission held a community meeting for widening Steamboat Parkway. Several of the attendees asked whether the revision would address speeding. The project manager provided this response. Uh, there's no plans to change the speed limits on the current roadway. The roadway classifications do match the, the posted speed limit out there. There was a recent feed study that was done on Veterans Parkway, and the 85th percentile, or 85% of all drivers out there on Veterans Parkway do match the posted speed limit. There is no plans to change the current posted speed limit along that, on Steamboat Parkway. In other words, people are speeding, but not so many people that RTC feels the need to change the speed limit. With the way this response was worded, it sounds like the response to excessive speeding would be to increase the speed limit to maintain the 85th percentile rule. This is where the 85th percentile rule stops making sense. It basically assumes that a portion of drivers are going to be speeding anyway, and it allows traffic engineers to easily brush off speeding as a non-issue. Speeding is not an anomaly. It is a product of this standard. This is why you can't just lower speed limits. The speed limits are set based on how fast drivers are naturally going, and when those speed limits are arbitrarily lowered, it doesn't actually cause anyone to slow down. It just makes it so more drivers are technically speeding, which could actually be more dangerous for drivers who do follow the lower speed limits. Now that these 35 mile per hour speed limit signs have been installed, there's going to be a mix of several different speeds. Some drivers are going to slow down and maintain the 35 miles per hour speed limit. Others are not going to realize there's a new speed limit, or they may slip into their old habits and continue driving the 45 mile per hour speeds that the road is designed for. Finally, there would still be the street racers mentioned earlier. With this differential in vehicle speed, it's not unlikely that a slow-moving driver may be rear-ended by someone who is speeding. It would arguably be better to follow the 45 mile per hour speed that the road was designed for than to try following the 35 mile per hour speed limits. In fact, this is the exact conclusion from the original study that led to the 85th percentile rule in the first place. Of course, the city of Reno has another brilliant solution to ensure drivers maintain the 35 mile per hour speed limit. Reno Police Department will be enforcing it. 
this is continuing to miss the point. It doesn't matter how many people are going to receive citations during the nighttime 35 mile per hour speed when the crux of the issue is they are following the 85th percentile speed anyway. For a specific case study, we can look at Delta Drive in El Paso, Texas. Last year, El Paso Police Department tweeted about how they have issued 136 citations in the week leading up to August 10th. A month later, El Paso Community College civil engineering student Zachary Staggs decided to see if enforcement had any effect on vehicle speeds. He spent two hours tracking oncoming traffic from both sides, and he found eight out of every ten drivers exceeded the posted speed limit of 35 miles per hour. Speed traps are horrendously ineffective. This experiment does demonstrate why North American urban planning can be frustrating to watch. If a problem is not solvable with another sign, another lane, or law enforcement, then it seems like it is doomed to persist in our society because we won't try anything else. You can't police your way out of bad engineering design practices. People drive at the speeds they are comfortable with, and no amount of signage or policing is going to change that. The only genuine solution to changing vehicle speeds is changing the design of the streets and the roads. Since people drive at the speed that feels right, the streets and the roads must be designed to instill discomfort to force motorists to slow down. They should be concerned about hitting speed bumps, striking their tires on curves, and hitting obstacles. That concern would get them to slow down and make more careful maneuvers. The smaller streets, such as Carrot Avenue, Wilbur May Parkway, and Rio Wrangler Parkway would benefit greatly from raised crosswalks, otherwise known as wombat crossings. These act as a sort of speed bump, forcing the cars to slow down, and it also brings people to eye level with the other vehicle. And this, in conjunction with each other, makes for a significantly safer crossing. I certainly wish we had more of these and fewer rapid blinking pedestrian beacons. In fact, one Australian study found that raised crosswalks can reduce pedestrian casualties by up to 63%. This one change would be a lot more substantial than placing a couple of 35 mile per hour speed limit signs, and it can be coupled with plenty of other additional traffic calming measures. These simple traffic calming measures can go a long way. It makes the streets safer since drivers would do a better job paying attention to their surroundings and they would be more prepared to come to a complete stop. It would prevent street racers because the street would no longer be comfortable to drive fast and those speeds would risk damaging their vehicles. It would make the neighborhood quieter because slower cars produce less noise and of course it would reduce the number of horse vehicle collisions. Although there is still the matter of maybe Reno shouldn't have sprawled so far outwards that the city limits are intruding upon the space horses roam, but that would have to be a topic for a future video. Ideally, the street design would make it so drivers would never have to look for a speed limit sign because they would be able to subconsciously choose whichever speed feels right. Improving other roads will not be quite as straightforward. Veterans Parkway, Double Diamond Parkway, and Steamboat Parkway are going to require more extensive redesigns, which is why better design standards must be adopted now. Every street and road has a shelf life. It will last approximately 25 years before needing resurfacing. When that time comes, everyone involved in the project must be focused on redesigning the road so the design of the road reflects the desired 35 mile per hour speed limit. Urban environments are very different from rural highways. It is incredibly misguided to act as though the 85th percentile rule and the philosophy behind forgiving design is a catch-all for improving safety along every street and every road in the transportation system. We know more than we did in the 1960s. Engineering design standards should be routinely updated to reflect the additional knowledge. Once superior design standards are adopted, traffic engineers can begin fixing their past mistakes, instead of falling back on these insincere measures.